Um, that's where we're going to turn this morning. So I invite you to turn to Luke 15. Uh, Monday morning, I was thinking over what Jay had preached on last week in, in Mark chapter 2. God, knowing what it is we need the most, and to hear our Savior say, you are forgiven. I was just sitting with that, um, and then in my own devotional reading, it was, it was up to Luke 15, and I thought this would, uh, this would piggyback well uh, to that message going uh, into a new year. Uh, so we'll, we'll get back to Ecclesiastes probably next week. Uh, but this morning, I want us to hear these well-known uh, stories from the mouth of Jesus. Jesus is preaching, teaching, he's healing as he makes his way to Jerusalem. And uh, he's really gathering a new community around himself. Uh, he's extending the kingdom of God, inviting those to, to see their need, to humble themselves uh, before him and before others. And what we find in the Gospels is that those who see their need the most are the ones drawn to Jesus. Uh, they've very likely been rejected by others, but in Jesus they find someone who will listen, uh, someone who cares for them. And uh, that's actually not the Pharisees, that's not the experts in the law that we find. They are looking at Jesus, they're watching him very closely, but they're not looking to Jesus. Uh, they grumble against Jesus uh, in Luke 15. That's the springboard for these three uh, parables, two of which are unique to Luke's gospel. So our focus is going to be on that last story in verse 11 through 32, but it's important that we um, read them together. So Luke 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. The Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners, eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents and over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Verse 11. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the young son gathered all he had took, gathered all he had and took a journey <clears throat> into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, <clears throat> excuse me, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf. 
because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me. All that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. This is God's word to his people. Let's pray together. Lord, in these few moments this morning, we come under the authority, the inspiration of your word to us, and we are grateful We are grateful that you would speak to us in a way that we can hear and understand, fully recognizing that your spirit must work in this moment, taking this word and applying it to our hearts and our lives. So Lord, even as we ask you to to speak to us, we submit ourselves um, to this word. For you, our God, seek us. You have found us. Draw us ever closer to your heart, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I left West Michigan when I was 18 years old. I didn't run away, I wasn't kicked out, I did that of my own free will, Uh, left for Colorado, and since that time, we've made many trips back to West Michigan, but have not fully returned or settled back into that place I knew as home. Um, Now, if you were to ask me, well, Even now, where do you call home? I would probably reference West Michigan because that's where my family is. That's most of my family, where most of Katie's family is, where that place of familiarity and comfort is. Um, And we all know what this is like, you know, to be uh, part of or to be in a place of familiarity with those people that have, you know, informed and shaped our lives uh, so much. Memories, good memories, maybe not so good memories, Um, that place we call home. It's very powerful that the draw of home is very powerful. Um, You know, in the Lord's providence, in a few months, we'll have lived here in Arkansas longer than anywhere else as a family. So it feels more like home. Um, But that that longing for home or or to recreate that place of familiarity, um, I don't think that ever really leaves us. I mean, from a human psychological perspective, um, you know, when I, when I return to West Michigan, things have changed. The things, places have changed or they're not there anymore. People have changed or they're gone. Um, it's never going to be that home that I, I remember again. But even though that, that longing changes, it never really leaves us. And it doesn't leave us from a spiritual perspective, there's a longing that we have for, for home, trying to find our way back to that place that we belong, what's familiar, what's comfortable to us, a place of, of peace. Um, and even those who move around a lot, you know, it's hard to name a place called home. There's still that, that longing for origin, to be from somewhere. Um, it's just... It's not quite the same. We can't recreate it. Um, So if we're familiar with the great story, then we know why this is the case. From the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3, we're living in exile. By our own choosing, we have lost our true home. And we've been wandering as uh, spiritual exiles ever since then. So as we follow the the Bible story, one episode after another of those who are lost and exiled and find their way back home. That's you and me. We're lost in our sin. We've wandered away from our true home, our lasting home, the home that our wandering hearts long for. You simply can't recreate it no matter how hard we try. But God in His compassion, God in His mercy, He doesn't leave us there. That's what these three uh, stories are all about. What has been lost is found by God. 
So I want us to look at the heart of the lost, and we're going to look at the heart of the father who finds, a father who is exactly represented in the one who is sharing these stories, Jesus himself. Um, Have you ever lost your wallet? Oh, some of you are shaking your heads. Whoa. Um, How'd that go? I mean, that thing is pretty important. IDs, credit cards, some people still carry cash in those things. Um, thankfully, I've never lost my wallet, but I thought I had lost my wallet. I mean, you talk about a place of panic, and the world just sort of slows down, and that is what you are focused on, the only thing that you're trying to find. You'll gather others to retrace your steps. You know, where could, where could this wallet have been? That's, that's the sole focus of your search. Um, that's what we see in these first two stories that Jesus shares. Something of great value has been lost, and so the search is on. Uh, the shepherd who has charge over all the sheep will go after one who strays away from the flock. Or a woman who has you know, lost one day's wages. She still has all the other day's wages, but, but she seeks to recover what has been lost. So the sheep and the coin are valuable But here they're representing something of even greater value. Okay, Jesus is talking about people here. The sheep and the coin represent lost people like you, like me, who are found. Let me just reiterate that a little bit more. Lost people like you, like me, like the lawyers and the IRS agents, and the prostitutes, and the scammers, and the Democrats, and the Republicans. Jesus is talking about them, and to all of them. Verse 7 and 10, yeah, 7 and 10 show us that he's talking about people, for one, in the opening, tell us that all kinds of people are represented here. Uh, All people everywhere lost and in need to uh, return home. Um, So you, me, every person that we meet uh, is made in the image of God. Uh, So no matter how uh, beat up and tarnished that image may be, there is still honor, there is still dignity to the Creator. So He's deeply moved and seeks what has been lost. And here's where the Lord doesn't play percentages. Well, you know, I've got eight or nine, so... You know, that's good enough. No. No, that's not his heart. He seeks his own. And those who repent and turn to him are coming from all who are lost. So as we move into this this story of the father and the two sons, Jesus is, and he kind of mentioned this earlier, Jesus is helping us understand the lost. All are lost, but there are two kinds of loss that he brings uh, forward here for very good reason, because both kinds of lost are listening to him as he tells this parable. You've got the tax collectors and sinners and the Pharisees, both kinds of lost uh, represented by these sons. So the younger son, this is the bad boy. He's the one blowing, blowing off the old-time religion, um, living however well he pleases. He says, Dad, I wish you were dead. Give me what's coming to me. That's essentially what he's saying in verse uh, 12. Uh, and, and for this time period, I mean, that, that, I hope that sounds strange to our ears, but for this time period, absolutely unthinkable uh, to make that kind of request. I mean, the well-being, the status of this family would have been you know, sort of tied up in this property. And so this, this son wants to take that from the family, from this father. And for the father to do that, to give him his share, he would also have to give the older son his share. So two-thirds to the older son, one-third Uh, to the younger. And so the father then would have no property left um, to himself. It actually actually belonged to him. Um, So the younger son is rejecting the family, liquidates his inheritance, goes off um, and spends it. So he's lost in immorality, um, running from the father uh, in this story. Just like we run from the authority and love of God in our sin. Uh, We wander as exiles away from home. Trying hard, maybe try hard to find some purpose, trying far, hard to, to find some happiness and some joy in those things that have never intended to provide that satisfaction and that joy. 
could be money, it could be the property, it could be sex, it could be entertainment. That's a big one. Um, it could be a job status, maybe what's in the retirement accounts. That can be fun for a little while. It may fill the tank or, or, or cover the hurt and longing for a time, but you know how long before it's gone? Sometimes it doesn't take very long, as we see in this story. But the older son is also lost, and he's on the other end. Okay, he's the goody two shoes, keeps all the all the rules. He's the one, you know, who deserves a little recognition. He's earned this, after all, right? He's obeyed the rules from the very beginning, and now his father owes him. So think about the problem with this. Okay, why is he obeying the rules? Why is he sticking around instead of you know, hey, wait for me to his younger brother, and they take off together. Because he wants what's coming to him. Does that sound familiar? Because he wants power. He wants that, that leverage, that control. He's not obeying because he loves his father. Because he wants to get something from him. Dad, I've, I've done all these things faithfully. Now, you know, what about what's coming to me? So they both say the same thing. Dad, give me my share. I'm out of here. Dad, give me my share. I've been here the whole time. Both sons spiritually lost, both in rebellion against the father. One by being very bad, one by being very good. We can can run and rebel against God by either breaking all the rules or by keeping them the very best that we can. In either case, we're running. We're still lost. So I, I hope we're seeing ourselves. We need to see ourselves in both of these sons. You know, there are some seasons of life. You maybe look back on that season of your life. Maybe you're there now where this younger son is resonating when you look in the mirror and, and you see the stiff arm against God and His uh, word to you. Um, there are other times when Maybe more often than not, we are quite content by seeing the older son in the mirror. Um, but both, um, both are lost in their sin, needing to be found. So typically, uh, we read this parable. Uh, maybe you're thinking of a, a mansion you know, on a hill, all kinds of property, kind of looking out over the countryside, or a you know, nice farmhouse out in the country uh, as part of this. But... Um, not uh, for this time period um, in Jewish communities are actually very small. Uh, the homes are very close together. Everybody knew everybody else. Everybody knew everybody else's business. Some of you have lived in a community like that. Um, okay, the roads are are close together. You know, eight ten feet apart or eight ten feet you know wide. Um, so the community would have known what this son had done. And they would have known what the father had to do to make this possible. Um, and that it, when that's known, <laughs> you, you can imagine how a tight-knit community like that is going to respond. If, if that son showed his face again, <laughs> yeah, no way. That doesn't happen on our street. That doesn't happen in our community. Um, that, that's the attitude um, in, in the community and, and when this would have been known. Here's, here's what makes the heart of the Father, why this is so profound, who seeks what is lost. See, the Father has not given up on His Son um, in spite of all the trouble He's caused, in spite of all the disrepute upon the family. Um, and so the emphasis, even the parables, on the response of the sons, but, but we still see the, the Father fighting for His sons. He wants Him back. I mean, this tears, tears him apart. He's enduring loss. He's enduring suffering all for the love of his son. So parents, grandparents, um, take comfort in this. I'm not sure there's a more encouraging story in all of the New Testament for parents who pray endlessly, who plead with God for the well-being of their children and those that they love. Um, The youngest son does not stop being the son of this father, even after all of this. 
So we need to remember that, especially, you know, we've lost hope. We've had it, you know, up to here with our kids or others in the family. Um, Apart from Christ, the Father only has rebellious, disobedient children. That's the only kind He has. Um, We've all embarrassed Him. We have all mocked Him and run away in our sin. But He comes after us. He brings us back where we belong. Now remember, if this guy shows his face in the community, they're going to kick him out. Okay? They'll, let him write, they'll let him know that he doesn't belong. And so the Father has to get to him first before that happens. In Deuteronomy 21, you know, we read of the, the boundaries, the severe correction that God had established for His people uh, as part of the, the civil law. If a son was rebellious uh, against Uh, His parents did not heed the discipline of his parents. Well, they could bring him before the elders, and guess what? Didn't end well for him. Um, He's stoning. Okay, this was to instill a sense of awe and fear among God's people that he is holy. Um, So we know the attitude of the community toward this son, but that's not the heart of the father. So he embarrasses himself again, you know, shows his hairy legs, and starts running towards his son, running to embrace him. Only the father. He's the only one that can welcome him back. No one else is going to do this. Do we we see the amazing and overwhelming grace of God in the actions uh, of this father? He seeks what is lost, rejoices when the lost is found. I mean, he can hardly contain himself uh, in this picture, the Father has to, 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 to go to Him. Our Heavenly Father must seek us. He has to take the initiative to bring us back, um, no matter how far we have wandered. He doesn't forget. He doesn't give up. Um, he rejoices and sings over His children. People of God, if we had but a fraction of that heart for the lost... I mean, if we, if we really believed from, you know, really believe that the heart of the Father's love, that testimony about us, um, listen to what he says through the prophet Ezekiel, what our Father says to those who have been abandoned, abused by the very ones who should have been watching out for them. Here's what the Father says, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed. I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. The fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. And later, through Zephaniah, uh, people who would endure judgment, discipline uh, in their sin. Here's what God promises. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by His love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. This is quite a party, quite a celebration when the lost are found, when sons sons and daughters of the Father return to Him. Uh, If you see the Father, if you see God the Father with His arms crossed, if you see Him sort of looking down upon you in disdain or kind of eyebrows raised, wondering, you know, what it is you are doing, you don't see the Father rightly. Um, Rest in the Father's love. He looks upon you and runs to you and embraces you. Um, You're never going to be satisfied in another place. You're never going to be satisfied in the embrace of another. Uh, You can never recreate that, that home that you long for. It's only where He is. The father seeks, he rejoices, and he pleads with the older son. Again, this is going to be humiliating for the father. He has to leave the party and has to go out and and meet his son who wouldn't even come in himself to see what was going on. Um, So he's angry, he's extremely disrespectful to his father. He hasn't forgiven his younger brother. Doesn't even refer to to him as a brother anymore. That son of yours. Um, So... You know, a harsh rebuke by the father, we would think appropriate at this point in time. Um, But that's not what we see. 
patient father pleading with this arrogant, self-righteous son to come join the feast. But it, you know, all this, this arrogance, this pride kept him from celebrating with the rest of the family. It was destroying him. It was destroying his relationship with the family. That's something that we need to, you know, to be in tune with here. The cost of forgiveness is extremely high. And we will not, just like this older brother, we will not pay that price if we feel entitled or superior to the person that we must forgive. We won't do it. Okay, we cannot forgive from the heart if we feel superior. We feel like we're a judge over someone else. So that, I hope that causes us to, to pause just a little bit. Um, I know that's really under construction, my own heart. Um, hard to, to forgive, to be reconciled to someone who has hurt me. If I can't do that, then what's really, under, what's really in my heart? What, what pride is there? Uh, what selfishness may be there that says, well, I'm, I'm here and you're down there. I, there's no forgiveness. Um, we see the gracious, compassionate heart of the Father. Um, so here, Here's another example, another story that, that Jesus really leaves open-ended. The father pleads with the older son to come in to join the celebration, but what does he do? We don't, we don't actually know how he responded. You know, did he change his mind or did he just keep you know, going about his work, grumbling as he went? Um, Jesus doesn't, Jesus doesn't, uh, you know, he doesn't forget the conclusion of the story. It's just left open-ended for a reason because you know, that, that answer is up to us. What will be the response of the older brother Pharisees and scribes who are grumbling against Jesus? What will be our response? I mean, this is amazing how Jesus, you know, the ones who are out to trap and discredit Jesus, yet he patiently pleads with them to return in this story, to acknowledge the gift that's been given to them by the Father in his very presence. The work of the Father is the work of Jesus. He's pleading for those who are listening to return. Return to the feast. Leave that older brother attitude behind. Anger, anxiety, insecurity, they're all fruits of the elder brother. There's a noticeable, noticeable drudgery to life without joy when we entertain the spirit of the elder brother. The deadness, uh, repulsed by sin because it's, because it's blind to its own sin. Um, the call is to repent. That's where the heart of the younger son goes. Um, he's been broken. He actually sees his brokenness. Remember those who are drawn to Jesus? Recognizes he's in a bad spot. He has to own his own sin. Um, he recognizes that. That's step number one. He confesses that sin, which moves him to return to the Father. Um, that, that's just an essential element of repentance and, and being restored. But notice something else. The younger son doesn't even get to say what he had planned to say. He doesn't even get to go through this confession speech. Before he's received with open arms, the Father embraces him. Um, you know, when, when, this, when this mercy, when this love uh, is there, that actually makes confession a little bit easier, doesn't it? When you know that you're embraced, when you know that you're loved, Father's already, you know, Father's already got him in this big bear hug. What's he going to do? Um, he's not letting him go. So he can pour out his heart in confidence at that, at that moment. Same is true for you. Same is true for me. Okay? We love that most powerful motivator in our lives. It's far easier to be honest, far easier to confess our need before God when we know that He's holding us. He's not letting us go. And so the love of God in, in Jesus drives away sin. It moves our hearts to repentance, to obedience. The poet William Cowper, John Newton took him in. He often struggled with depression. But he captures this well in his verse. He says, To see the law by Christ fulfilled and hear his pardoning voice changes a slave into a child 
and duty into choice. We're moved to obedience. We run to Him because He's still, we see Him as all that we need. No other place we'd rather be, no other place where we're safely home than the arms of our Savior. So Jesus, Jesus came to bring us back home. Um, and He did this at great cost to Himself. Remember, forgiveness is costly. Someone has to pay. In this story, it would have been the angry, resentful, self-righteous older brother who has to pay for all this celebration and wasted resources. But our older brother isn't like this. He's not like this at all. He obeyed perfectly. Um, He's done all the Father's will. Um, Gave his very life for us. Slaughtered so that you and I could be brought back into the feast. Um, The definition of prodigal, it's really to give or to spend profusely. To be recklessly extravagant. Brothers and sisters, this is the posture of God towards us as sinners. I mean, this is about prodigal sons, yes. As one one prominent pastor names a book, is this a prodigal God who pursues us with absolute abandon? Gives everything, not wastefully, but graciously to welcome us back. So there's a longing that each of us have to return home, to be in that place of comfort and security where we are known, where we're accepted and loved, where we belong, Jesus came to bring us back to our true home. So no more wandering, no more living in exile. We, we find the peace of, of home in Him now while we look forward to that great feast at His return when every place in His presence will be our home. Let's pray together. Lord God, that is our desire. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and, and make this place our true home once again in your presence for where you are, that is where we desire to be. And we thank you that you're present with us now, that you've given us a taste, a foretaste of the glorious inheritance that is ours in the Lord Jesus, our true and faithful elder brother who has sacrificed all for us. Oh Lord, what a glorious, glorious gospel. We thank you for these stories that remind us of your covenant love, that remind us and draw us ever closer to the heart of the Father. You are God who loves us. Go before us now. Send us in your peace and with a desire to obey out of this great love for you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.